everybody. Welcome to church. Happy Sunday. So glad you've joined us this weekend. And let me take a moment and say hello to everyone at our online location. Glad you are along for the ride. And then at our Hocassin location as well. Newark, will you help me show some love for all of our locations? Very glad we're all one church, many places, but together today. And for any of you at any location that are here for the first time, a big welcome to you as well. We are kicking off a brand new series called Money, Sex, Power. So if you knew that in advance and came to church anyway, way to go. Good for you. Glad you're here. And I think it's going to be fun. And, and let me just say right out of the gate, if you're skeptical about church or the Bible, maybe you came today, you were invited, or you uh, decided to check it out, and you're, and you're kind of on the fence trying to figure out what you believe about all of that, that's okay. I'm not here to twist your arm about anything today, but I think what most of us can agree on, whatever we believe or don't believe, is that these three things, money, sex, and power, can bring a lot of happiness to our lives or a whole lot of hurt. And I think you don't have to be a Christian to know that that's true. In fact, it struck me, I didn't plan to say this, but I was thinking today uh, that whatever you are currently binge watching on Netflix, one of those three things is probably the main plot. Money, sex, or power, right? I mean, it's just kind of, even the whole world around us knows that these three things hold a lot of potential for good and also a lot of potential uh, for hurt and for pain and for, uh, for confusion. In fact, there's something about, even in our culture, that we, I don't really know what it is, I'm not going to soapbox about it, but we kind of enjoy watching other people struggle with those three things. Like, there's, that's what we like to watch. It's, it's entertaining to us, and so we're aware of all of the the, the uh, potential that these three things have. And it's especially true in our relationships, right? So let me do a quick poll as we kick off the series today. Love for all of you to participate, all of our locations. All right, so anybody had an argument about money over the past few months? Just be honest, be honest. Raise your hand if you're in the room, New York Cast online. Raise your hand, nobody can see you anyway, so wave it, just, you know, uh, be brave. Uh, with your parents, your kids, your girlfriend, your spouse, your ex, you've had a money fight, most of us have. Anybody ever feel like somebody in your life was trying to control you? Anybody ever feel that way? I feel a little manipulated, a little bit like somebody's trying to control me. I don't like it. I don't like it. Be real brave. How many of you have tried to control someone else? Just, all right. If you're a couple and you both raise your hands, you know, it's, we just solved your problem. All right, look at it. Oh, it's that, oh. And then finally, you don't have to raise your hand on this one unless you are online, because you can, but it, if you're in a room, you don't have to raise your hand on this one. But anybody ever have any confusion or frustration or unmet expectations around sex? Just kind of raise one eyebrow at me. Just sort of, you know, <laughs> I'll see it and I'll know. So me too, all right? All of the above, sometimes in the same week. <laughs> Let's just be honest. I think a lot of us, if we were honest, would say, yeah, we've, man, we've, we've wrestled with all of those things. So why do these three things hold so much potential for good and yet so much potential for bad, especially in our relationships? And are we just doomed to struggle with them forever? Or is there a way, a better way to approach them where we can make sense of, of these three things and actually channel them and understand, get to the place, wouldn't you like this again, whatever you believe, get to the place where you control them instead of them controlling you? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Uh, even if nothing else happened in our lives, if we could just get a handle in these, on these three areas, our lives would be better. And that's what this series is about. So you're going to want to come back every week. If you just hear one message, it'll be incomplete. There are four weeks in the series, all going to build on each other. And I want to encourage you to be here uh, every week for this. So for today, I want to set the stage for the series. And then we're going to talk about one of these three things. But first of all, let's lay the foundation that faith in God. So we're, we're gathered together today. Uh, either because we have faith in God or we're interested in learning more about what faith in God would look like. Faith in God is founded on a claim that God makes that he alone is worthy of our worship. Now, worship is not a word that we use a ton outside of church circles, but it basically means devotion or focus or attention. And the idea is that whatever or whoever we worship is at the center of of our lives. So God makes this claim that only he is qualified to be in that position in our lives. Only he is worthy to be our capital G God, the one who deserves our worship. And you may not buy that yet, but we, we got to give God this. We got to give him marks for consistency because he says this over and over again. If you read the Bible, it's a big theme throughout. Uh, one of the biggest themes, which we'll talk about next week, possibly the biggest theme of the Bible is how God feels about us. 
But another big theme is, is his insistence that he alone is really qualified to be our God and that our lives get better when he's at the center of them and they get worse when he's not. And we find at the same time humans over and over again chasing after false gods or what the Bible often refers to as idols. And it's not talking about celebrities necessarily, but anything that we'd set up and give worship to. And it's often our desire for more wealth, more sex, more power, more respect, more reputation that causes us to choose these false gods. And one place in the Old Testament, this happens over and over again, but this is just one example God speaks to our idols. So he speaks to the people and things that we tend to elevate above him. And he says this, those who choose you, so those who put you at the center of their lives, those who decide, man, I'm going to chase after what's going to give me money, or what's going to give me power, what's going to give me sex, what's, what's going to satisfy those desires, that's going to be first in my life, that's my primary pursuit. Those who choose you pollute themselves. And again, I don't... That may rub you the wrong way, but I don't think you have to be a Christian to believe that, okay, God, that's kind of true. I mean, think of the times in your life when you scored financially, relationally, socially, romantically, and when the dust settled, it didn't fulfill you the way you thought it would. I mean, how many of us, you don't have to say exactly what it is, but how many of us have been convinced at one point in our lives, man, if I just had more of one of those three things, my life would be complete only to discover that when we got more, we were at least as dissatisfied as we were before, if not more. How many of us would just be honest? Go on, how many of us have said, oh, I can't, we got a raise and we're like, oh, I'm rich now. We got like this big raise. I'm finally on this track. Three months later, like, where's all my money going? Taxes and bills. And we feel broker than we did before, right? We're like, we feel more protective. How many of us drove an old junker car for years? And then we finally got a new car. We're like, oh, now I can just relax. I've got a nice car. It's reliable. And then we're worried about it. We look at it. Every time we come out, we're like, is that a scratch? <laughs> oh! And we bow down in the parking lot, build a little altar. And we're, no, we don't do that. <laughs> but what's happening is we thought this thing would fulfill us. How many of us, we were, we, man, we finally reached a certain number of followers on social media, and we're like, okay, now my life's complete. That's all I really wanted in life. And then we post something, and we're watching the hearts, and they're not moving fast enough, and somebody gives a little sideways comment, and we're like, ah, I'm not popular, I'm not loved, what is the purpose of living? And we're just, without realizing it, we're worshiping something that, Here's the reality, just can't do for us what it says it can do for us. And it's not that those things in and of themselves are bad, but they become toxic when we set them up as idols in our lives, when we turn anything or anyone into something we worship, what the Bible would call a God or an idol, we think it's going to provide the peace and the connection and the intimacy and security that we desire, but it doesn't work. And that's how good things like money, sex, and power, which are all can be very good things, just so you know. And some of you are like, no, I've been to church before. I know you think all those things are bad things. No, they can be good things. But when we turn them into idols, they become toxic. And it happens when we choose them above God. When we don't put them in their rightful place in our lives and we elevate them into something that we have to have more of to be fulfilled. And then like a factory secretly dumping toxic waste into a town's water supply, our lives and relationships begin to show the cancerous signs of false gods. It is worshiping the wrong thing or the wrong relationship or the wrong person that we're convinced can fulfill us. But God says, no, when you choose it, it pollutes you, which means the question for all of us, all of us have to answer this question. Will we choose the real God who created us and loves us and give him our worship and our devotion? Or will we continue to chase after false gods who at the end of the day pollute our lives and relationships? Okay, so that's the foundation for the series. And I'm, again, encouraging you to come back every week because it's an important question and the answer to it has a profound impact on what the rest of our lives end up being like. And so if that's the case, then the question is, is there a better way? Like if, if we've got these false gods competing for our attention and we're so tempted so often, all of us, myself included, to chase after them, is there a better way? And I believe there is. So over the next few weeks, we're going to get a new look at who the real God is. 
Not the God religion has imposed on us or the God we made up in our own mind or even our, the God of our Western civilization, but the real God who has always sought to reveal himself to people who genuinely seek him and want him to be their God. We're going to get a good look at him. For some of us, maybe the first look we've ever had at who the real God is. For others of us, it'll be a reminder of who he is. And then in the process, we'll shine some light on some false gods who try to rise up in our lives, not from a place of shame or condemnation, because again, we're all tempted to worship them, but to help us put things right in our lives and our relationships so we can experience everything God has for us. That sound good to everybody? So that's what we're going to do during this series, and we're going to start today with this thing called power, and we'll get to sex next weekend. So if you're like, man, I was coming for the sex talk. It's coming next weekend, all right? So let's talk about power. So let's do another poll. How many of us have ever wished, got to be honest on this again, all of our locations, how many of us have ever wished you were more popular? Any point in your life you've ever wished you were more popular, uh, more well-liked? How many of us would say, well, I don't care about being popular, but what I do want is to be respected? How many of us would say, I want to be respected? Oh, there we go. All right. We got the respect people in the house today. How many of us have ever been frustrated because someone we're in a relationship with does not do what we want them to do? Would you just raise your hand? Just they're not doing, I don't understand. I put the batteries in, I followed the directions, not doing what I thought they would do. Uh, so let me ask that question another way. Uh, how many of us have kids? Okay. How many of us in any relationship have not felt heard? We just feel like this person's not even listening to me. Let me ask the question another way. How many of us have parents? All right, so we're getting, we're getting everybody on board here. How many of us are in any kind of relationship where we're just a little disappointed because the other person does not seem to recognize how awesome and important we really are? How many of us just, all right, good, it's leading up to Valentine's Day, we just get this taken care of. How many, last one, how many of us feel like a martyr in a relationship because we're working harder than the other person or people? How many of us, are, just be honest, how many, let me ask it this way, how many of us are doing Christ-like things but with a decidedly un-Christ-like attitude? How many of us just, like we're doing, we're like, I'll do the dishes, but I resent you. <laughs> all right, so power, all these questions have to do with power. And power on its own is not a bad thing, but when we feel like we don't have enough, what happens is we're tempted to worship it, to chase after it as a false god. And you say, well, why do we do that? All of us do it. And the, the answer is because we're trying to get to something we do genuinely need. At the heart of this, in fact, at the heart of all of what the Bible calls idolatry is a desire to get something that we do need. And in this case, what we need is a sense of purpose. We need to know that our lives matter. We need to know that we really are important and valuable and worth respect and worth listening to. And so what happens is we give into this temptation to use whatever power we have. And I'm going to show you today that we all have some, whether we believe it or not. We're tempted to use the power we have to seem important instead of believing that being made in the image of the real God is enough to indicate that we are important. That just knowing who we are in God should be enough for us. If we would re-elevate the real God to his proper place and position in our lives and we would look to him, what we would see is, oh, I am made in your image. You created me. You love me. You chose me. My circumstances don't indicate my worth. You indicate my worth. I am enough. But the problem is we look away from God. We look to other people and things to satisfy us and always always in that case we begin to get this false message that being made in the image of God is not enough. And so we seek to use power and in the process we misuse it, all of us, in our relationships. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is a shift in our focus and nobody points that out better than the person who had more power than anyone who has ever walked the face of our planet, someone named Jesus. So a guy named John tells us that one night toward the end of his life, Jesus is in the room with his closest friends. And there's a lot going on. Jesus has told his friends, his disciples, that he's about to be arrested. He's going to suffer. He will be crucified. So this is a Roman form of capital punishment at the time. They would suspend someone on a cross. In Jesus' case, they nailed him to this cross, and he hung there until he died. And Jesus has told his friends, this is what is about to happen, and they don't get it. They're thinking, why would the person who has more power than anyone else we know give up control of his life like that? 
Why would he lay down his life? In fact, Jesus' friends are so intoxicated with this idea of power as something that they're chasing after and idolizing in their lives that they have been arguing that night about which of them is the greatest while Jesus is in the room. (laughs) How cocky is that? I mean, they're all like, I don't know. I think I'm the greatest. No, I think I'm the greatest. And Jesus is over there like, what? And then John tells us that something very unexpected happens. Now, if you're new to the Bible, new to the story of Jesus, you might be thinking, well, what is it? Like, does Jesus go crazy on these guys? Like, does he, does he stand up and say, you're all fired. I'm getting 12 new disciples. You guys just don't get it. What happens? No. John tells us that something very unusual takes place. And he prefaces this by telling us why it took place. You got to pay attention to this. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. So in his humanity, Jesus had his eyes on the Father, on God, and he knew that he was given authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. In other words, he knew who he was. And he knew his past was secure, his future was secure, his present was secure. So, it's important, He got up from the table, took off his robe, his outer cloak, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. John tells us that Jesus knew how powerful he was. He knew where he came from, where he was going, so he got up, took off his robe, we read it, wrapped a towel around his waist, He poured water into a basin or a bowl. And then he got down on his hands and knees without saying a word. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with a towel. Now, the image may be a little bit lost on us because we don't do this anymore. It's not a common thing in our generation. I don't, I don't know about you, but I wash my own feet. <laughs> Culture changed. But you have to understand that in Jesus' time, this was very common. When you showed up for an important event, like a meal like this, you would be met at the door by a servant. And the reason was because you didn't Uber to the event. You walked. Most people walked. And the streets weren't paved, they were covered with dirt. And if you didn't walk, you rode an animal, and the animals made deposits on the road as they traveled. And so you were wearing sandals, you walked whatever it was, a mile, two, three, in your sandals on a dirt road covered with mud and animal excrement to the degree that you couldn't tell which was which. And when you arrived, your feet would be caked with this beautiful combination of mud and you know what? So the lowest servant in the household, the minimum wage, entry level, like whoever showed up last with the worst resume, would meet you at the door and would wash your feet and you wouldn't even pay any attention to them. It would be like, you know, Someone at a restaurant coming and clearing the the plates off the table. You don't engage them in conversation necessarily. You're already in a conversation, so they're just just doing their job. It's what they're supposed to do. They're serving you. You you paid. You showed up. It's their job to serve you. That was what happened. You showed up in your sandals covered with dirt and filth, and a servant bent down and washed your feet. Then you went into the dinner. Well, imagine this. All 12 disciples, nobody had done that. So they're all sitting around eating dinner, and their feet are still filthy. And they're arguing about who's awesomest. Years ago, I went to a leadership event, and there was a guy there who asked me if he, could take, if he and his wife could take me and Susie, my wife, out to dinner after uh, one of the, uh, the events, one of the, one of the sessions had ended. And initially, I said yes, but then I got a better offer. So there were some successful leaders at this event who had never really paid any attention to me before, but all of a sudden, 
invited me to hang out with them that night. And they were people I really wanted to be around. So I went to the first guy and I let him know, hey, I'm not going to be able to go out because man, I really want to spend time with these people. I don't get this opportunity very often. We'll do it another time. And when Susie found out, she wasn't with me when I told him, when she found out, she was so mad. She made me go to that guy's hotel room that night and apologize. It was late, like I woke him up. She said, you're going to go to his hotel room and you're going to tell him you are so sorry that you were so arrogant and unkind that you canceled him for someone else. And uh, so I did, because... I want to stay married. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I would love to tell you it was a great move of God in my life, but <laughs> I, was, I was really young at the time, and uh, I would have never said this, but man, I built a little altar, and I worshiped the opportunity for a little more power, to be recognized, included, that false God of seeming important whispered to me, Mark, just... Hey, just worship me just a little. I can fulfill you. You know what the problem is? And by the way, if you're disappointed in me, uh, welcome to Real Church for Real People. I mean, I'm not there anymore, but I haven't arrived either. And uh, I find myself in this story because you know what the problem is on this night with Jesus and his friends? There are two problems. Number one there aren't any servants there. And number two, there aren't any servants there. You understand the two problems? Number one, there isn't anybody who's been assigned. And number two, there isn't anybody who understands. There aren't any people willing to serve, just power-hungry disciples. So Jesus, without saying a word, becomes a servant. Why would he do such a thing? Why does the most important person in the room decide that what he should do next is kneel down on his hands and feet with a bowl of water and a towel and start washing the crud off of his friend's feet? It's because he knows who he is and he knows whose he is. He's not insecure. He's not chasing after this false god of power. And so while his disciples are worshiping their own need to feel important and respected and included and validated, Jesus shows us how to put power in its proper place in our relationship. Jesus shows us that power is a gift when we use it to serve others. It becomes a God the moment we use it to serve ourselves. And all of us are either surrendering our power in the service of others or using our power in the service of ourselves. And then if you're like me, you do both in the same day because you're trying to grow and it's a process. Now, some of us may think, well, man, it's easy for Jesus to serve. If I knew I had all power, I would serve too. Would you, though? You know the amazing thing about money, sex, and power? They're all great revealers, which means what we do when we get a little tends to reveal exactly what we would do if we had more. So I don't handle my money very well now because I don't have that much of it. And God says, I know exactly. Like the only... The only evidence that God has for how we would treat more if he gave it to us is how we're stewarding what we currently have. And Jesus said it. He said, to whom much is given, of them much is required. And those who use what little they have well will be given more. And the truth is money, sex, and power tend to reveal our inner world, tend to reveal our character. They're outward things, and the way we feel about them and act toward them and use them or misuse them tends to reveal what's going on inside of us and who we worship. And you have power. I have power. We all do. Think about your relationships. Think about your friends, your family, your kids, your parents, your coworkers, spouse, neighbors, employees, employer. We all have a relationship right now in which we have power power. You can snap at your three-year-old and they better listen because you have the power. I mean, you have the power in that relationship. You say, you don't know my (laughs) three-year-old. You have the power and you know you do deep down. You know the buttons to push to make your girlfriend give in. You have power. You know that if you take that far right lane and speed up right before that guy gets over that you win. (laughs) And while you act calm inside, you're like, I've got the power. (laughs) We 
Where are my late 80s, early 90s people? Come on. <laughs> you decide how much tip to leave that server. You decide how angry it look to shoot at that employee. You decide how much you're going to go off when the customer service is not what you want it to be. You decide how much you can get away with with your parents, especially your mom, because she's such a sucker. You have power. You have power. The question is not, do you have power? The only question is, what will you use it for? What will you use it for? When we set power up as a God in our relationships, no matter how much we get, it's never enough. But when we surrender our power to the real God and use it to serve others, it transforms us and our relationships, which is why after washing their feet, Jesus put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you get it? Please tell me you get it. Do you understand what I was doing? Why does he say this? Because he's about to go to the cross. He's going to die for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God, have a relationship with the real God, the God we could never get to on our own. We now have a path through the sacrifice of Jesus. Then he's going to rise again from the dead, which nobody else has ever done quite like him. Stone's going to be rolled away. He's going to walk out alive. And then he's going to ascend to heaven, and he's going to give this whole thing, this faith thing, this church thing, this spiritual thing, he's going to give it to us, his disciples, and not only that, but he's going to give us the same power he had. Jesus said, greater things than I've done will you do because I'm going to the Father. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He's going to give us power. And so he says, just before I go, please tell me you know how to use it. Please, I need to know that you know what to do with the power you have. This week, we're hosting something at our church called Night to Shine, and uh, it's a prom for students and young adults with special needs, and it's a drive through event. We'll set it all up in our parking lot, and they'll drive through, and at the end, every one of them gets crowned prom king or prom queen, and I took my son through it last year, and he was just He's wearing his crown at the end. He stared at himself in the pastor side mirror the entire way home, just like. <laughs> and you know how we're going to pull it off? You. Because a bunch of you are going to show up to serve. And a bunch of people are going to be here, rolling up their sleeves, grabbing a bowl, grabbing a towel teachers and students and VPs and mechanics and data analysts and small business owners, grabbing a bowl, grabbing a towel, living out this truth that power is a gift when we use it to serve others. It becomes a God when we use it to serve ourselves. And so many of us would say, well, I'm not an idolater. <laughs> I don't even know what that word really means. I'm not worshiping some false god. You know what you worship. We know what we worship by what we think about most. What we do, do the most to protect. What we worry about losing the most. That's at the center of our lives. And Jesus shows us there's a better way to approach power in relationships. It's grabbing a bowl and a towel. And it isn't weakness, by the way. If you're thinking, oh, yeah, I just need to be more of a servant. I need to be a pushover. Jesus was not a pushover. He didn't serve from a place of weakness. He served from a place of great strength. He knew the Father had given him everything. How would your life change if you really believed God had given you everything you need? That you didn't need anything this world had to offer, that everything you needed came from God, that he was your provider, that he really would. Imagine if we believed what we sang earlier, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, 
I mean, how would our lives change? This isn't about serving people we're in relationships with out of pressure or guilt or shame or because we think it will make an impression. This is out of a deep confidence that we know who we are and whose we are. Jesus says, listen, if you get it, then you know I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Don't just think about it. Don't just come to church once a week and talk about it. Don't just... Don't just get in your group and talk about it. Don't stop there, but do it. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. If you will let go of your power, God will bless your relationships. And he will show up in ways you can't even imagine. In other words, Jesus says, use your power to serve. Don't let it use you. Don't misuse it. Stop chasing and grabbing and clawing. Some of us are so upset. I mean, we go through life with teeth clenched and blood pressure high. Everybody owes us. I don't know why I did that. It's because that's how a lot of us drive. Every, like, kids aren't doing what I want them to. Parents aren't doing what I want. My spouse, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my boss. If they would just get their act together, my employees. I know you never thought of it of it before, but you know what that is? Worship. Just aimed at the wrong God. That's why it's so deeply unfulfilling. But this, this is an approach to relationships that actually works. So week one of the series, here's the hidden hack for our relationships when it comes to power. Choose one important relationship in your life, and this week, Instead of seeing that person, that relationship, as a means to get what you want or you need, see it as an opportunity to serve. Grab a bowl, grab a towel, get low, let your pride slip away. You say, well, it's... I'll be happy to do that for the people in my life who deserve it. Yeah, I don't think those disciples deserved it that night. Jesus served. You'll be amazed at how powerful you actually feel when you use what you've been given to serve others instead of to serve yourself. So if you're new to all of this and you want to get to know more about God, again, I want to encourage you to come back next week. But I also challenge you, give this a shot this week. Take one relationship, the one that's going the poor, most poorly right now. And for one week, I'm not asking you to do it for the rest of your life. Do it for one, for one week. Grab a bowl, grab a towel, serve that person. For all of you who are here, you're skeptical, but you know something needs to change, I'm encouraging you, do this for one week. Don't try to win. Don't try to score. Don't, don't try to get ahead. Serve. No strings attached. Do it because you have the power to choose. When we grab for power, we just show how weak we are. But when we use power to serve others, we show how strong we are. And then for all of us who are followers of Jesus, remember that Jesus promised to give us great power. But he was so clear about the why. We don't receive power so that we can dominate, manipulate, and retaliate like the world around us. Jesus said you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes into your life so that more people can learn about me. You're a follower of Jesus. The purpose of our power is that more people would not see us, but see Jesus through us. So use your power for that this week. Invest in people's lives. Invite them to experience God with you. Get connected in a J group and serve the people you're in a group with. Serve on the J team. Give your first. Be generous. Put God first in your life. Those are all ways to live a bowl and towel kind of life. Built-in opportunities for genuine worship. Because the truth is, power is a gift when you use it to serve others. And it becomes worship to the real God. It becomes a God when you use it to serve yourselves. The question is not, do you have any? Because you do. You have power. The question is simply, 
which will you use it for? And if you would say week one of the series, and I want power to become a gift in my life by giving God control of it, rather than a God that controls me, would you just shoot your hand up all over the room? Here in New Ark, Hokesson, lift it up high online. Join us in this moment. And let me pray for us. Jesus, we love and honor you. We're blown away that you, the most important person in the room, would kneel down and wash our feet as an example to us of how we should live. And it's hard, Jesus, we're just going to own it right here. It's hard. It's hard to have a bowl and a towel in our hands when we feel like the world around us is trying to manipulate us. People are trying to control us. We're not getting what we're due. It's not fair. But Jesus, we're asking you right now to give us the strength to look at you and to know who we are, to find out who we are by looking at you, and then to use that to serve. We ask it in your name, Jesus, and we commit ourselves to it today. I don't know what brought you here today, but if you sense God's drawing you to him, and again, I want to say if you're here and you're just, you're still trying to figure out what you believe, there's no pressure to believe anything. It needs to be a moment for you and God when it happens. But there are some of you in in our rooms watching online right now that God's drawing you to him, perhaps. And this is a moment when you want to begin a real relationship with God. And I'll tell you very simply how you do that. You do that by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus didn't just pick up a bowl and a towel to serve us. He took up a cross, died on it to save us. And it's only through faith in him that we can have a relationship with the real God. We don't earn that relationship. We don't, we're not given it after six months of solid church attendance. It's a gift. It comes through faith in Jesus. And if you want that today, I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer. So all of us are going to open our hearts up to God together again. And if that's you at all of our locations, if you would say, I want to begin a real relationship with God, whisper out a prayer of faith, something like this. Jesus, today, I believe in you. I believe you died to forgive my sins. And that when I put my trust in you, it means I belong to God. God, I want to know you. Save my life today. And if that's you, while everyone around you stays focused on God, if you would say, I want to be included in that prayer, will you lift your hand and hold it up high all over the room? Yeah, yeah. And Hope Kesson, lift it up high. Yes, you're in new arc hands going up online. Let us know in the comments. Type the word faith. Whatever platform you're on, we want to celebrate with you. And then everybody together, can we give Jesus all the praise and all the honor?